2,000 tons, and their main armament was eight 16-inch guns in four turrets. The Colorados were protected by up to 18 inches of turret armor and 13 and a half inches of belt armor. Deck armor was three and a half inches. The guns of the Colorado battleships were capable of throwing a 2,100 pound armor piercing shell, which could penetrate almost 19 inches of armor at nearly seven miles. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in December 1941, two of the three Colorado-class battleships were hit. Maryland was damaged and West Virginia was sunk. However, both ships were successfully repaired and modernized. Too slow to accompany Third Fleet's fast carriers, Maryland and West Virginia, along with four other veteran battleships, were intended for shore bombardment duties at Leyte Gulf. What no one expected was that the old battleships would end up fighting a classic fleet action. The escort carrier was first conceived as a cheap way to provide anti-aircraft and anti-submarine cover to convoys carrying war materials and troops across the Atlantic. As the war in the Pacific had gathered pace, a new role was found for the escort carriers. They could relieve the fast fleet carriers of the task of giving air support to amphibious landings. By the end of the war, more than 100 escort carriers would be built, almost half of them of the Casablanca class. Displacing 7,800 tons, the Casablanca carriers had a top speed of just over 19 knots and could carry 28 aircraft. Unlike the fleet carriers, they had no armor, double hulls or anti-torpedo blisters. As a result, because their official designation was CVE, their crews called them combustible, vulnerable, and expendable. 18 escort carriers would take part in the Leyte landings. Of these, 14 would be Casablanca-class vessels. By 1944, American carrier pilots, the men at the cutting edge of the war at sea, were trained to a higher standard than the flyers of any other navy. There was no shortage of high quality recruits, nor were training programs limited by aircraft availability or fuel supplies. Even the rawest American naval aviator had two years training and more than 350 hours flying time. His instructors were also of the highest quality. Unlike the Japanese who kept their pilots on operations until they were killed, the Americans rotated theirs through the training schools. The experience of veterans was continually passed on to new flyers, leading to a degree of tactical sophistication that the Japanese could no longer match. As for the sailors of the American fleets that would clash with the Japanese at Leyte, morale had never been higher. It was plain that the Pacific War had turned in America's favor, and although reverses could be expected, few doubted that the Imperial Navy would be defeated. Lengthy periods on operations had raised seamanship and gunnery skills to very high levels, 
and in both American fleets there was a keen desire to come to grips with the enemy. At Leyte, the sharp spirit of aggressiveness which now permeated the United States Pacific Navy would change the course of the whole battle. Although the big surface warships of the Japanese fleet were now permanently based near Singapore, Japanese planners would much prefer to have kept them in home waters. Near Japan, they would have been close to the carriers, which had to be home to wait for their new planes and air crew. The problem was that Japan was suffering from a desperate fuel shortage and so the big ships had to be kept close to the East Indies oil fields. The cause of the Japanese fuel crisis lay with the activities of the American Pacific Submarine Fleet. 140 boats now prowled the Japanese sea lanes and they had sunk 4 million tons of Japan's shipping. The Empire had neglected its anti-submarine defences until it was too late, and by now it had lost more than half its oil tankers to underwater attacks. As a result, the Japanese Navy would have fuel enough for only one major sortie, and would be unable to venture out again for another two months. For the Japanese, the worst possible scenario would be if the Americans attacked before the Imperial Carrier Force could unite with the rest of the fleet off Singapore. If that happened, the show plans would still have to go into operation, but the Navy would be forced to rely on its single remaining asset, the massive hitting power of its heavy surface warships. Japan could still field the big guns of nine battleships and more than a dozen heavy cruisers. The ships had been fitted with the most up-to-date radar, and if they could get in amongst an invasion force, preferably at night, they could cause unimaginable carnage and destruction. Displacing a massive 64,000 tons, the Yamato-class battleships were the largest naval vessels yet built by any nation. Yamato and her sister ship Musashi mounted the biggest guns ever fitted on a warship. The main battery was nine 18-inch weapons in three triple turrets. Each turret weighed two and a half thousand tons and the guns could fire an armor-piercing shell weighing nearly one and a half tons over 26 miles. The ship's armor protection matched their firepower. Belt armor was up to 16 inches thick and could stop an 18-inch shell at 12 and a half miles. Nine-inch thick deck armor could withstand the impact of a one-ton bomb dropped from 15,000 feet. Yamato's anti-aircraft guns were also heavily armored, but this was as much to protect their crews from the blast of her own 18 inches than from anything the enemy might do. At Leyte Gulf, the gigantic Yamato and Musashi would sail at the heart of the Japanese battle line. The most numerous of all Japanese aircraft, the Mitsubishi A6M Zero fighter, was the mainstay of the Navy's land and carrier-based fighter squadrons. 